What's up guys, it's your boy coming at you with another video, and today we've got another one of my existential crises. But instead of a demon girl, we're talking about a show that uh, is a little bit different. A bunny girl show. lost you yet? If I have not, great. The last video did so well that I decided to make another one of these, and if you want to see more, best way to let me know that you support them is by clicking like and clicking subscribe, and also, if you have any thoughts about what I'm about to say, and I guess you'll find out soon whether you do or not, leave a comment down below. It really helps me to see kind of what you like, what you don't like, and, and that kind of thing. But that said, today we are going to talk about the amazing show, Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai. Before I begin, I will say there will be some spoilers in this, so if you have any concern about spoilers, uh, you can literally just click the X button and, and go away. Uh, it's simple as that because I'm going to talk about them. I don't have timestamps because I'm lazy. And I really think that you guys are going to like this kind of introspective look at the, at the show. If you haven't seen the Jahi vid, it's going to be a lot like that, um, and I do recommend you watch it, but let's get straight into it. Let me give a little context about what Bunny Girl Senpai is. I'm sure many of you, if you've watched it, you essentially know what I'm gonna say, but just for context reasons, I think of um, Bunny Girl Senpai, the best way I can describe it is the Steins Gate of romance dramas. And if you haven't seen Steins Gate, go do yourself a favor and watch that one too. Both are great shows, Bunny Girl Senpai and Steins Gate. But it's basically a romance drama, but it also has this thing called puberty syndrome, which is kind of supernatural. Basically, it is these people who have internalized their feelings so much to the point where it almost like just explodes out of them. And there's like a second like being that can come out of you or like you can get cloned, you can get, you can create like a time loop. There's all sorts of things that can happen, but it's basically when you internalize something and then that it externalizes itself because you've internalized it so much. A little bit confusing, but that's the best way that I can easily explain it. So there's a few different examples. I'll try to explain them as we go through. Um, but just bear with me a little bit here because the point that I'm going to make actually doesn't really have anything to do with puberty syndrome, but I wanted to explain a little bit of the, the context of the show to make sense of things a bit when I kind of talk about them here. We're going to talk today not about any of the people who have puberty syndrome. Well, kind of, but like not the people that you would think of, not any of the specific arcs. We're going to be talking about the main man himself, Sakata. What he does throughout the series, he is basically just the guy who gets the plot moving. He's really good for a main character, by the way. Most main characters in any romance comedy or romance drama are usually pretty... I'm just gonna say they're kind of dumb, a lot of them. But Sakata's really kind of competent. He's humorous, but he's not, like, over the top or anything. He's a pretty chill dude, um, and he's a pretty knowledgeable dude, too. Just the, kind of his sense of wit and the way that he goes about things. Um, but he has a kind of a unique way of going, like, of meeting people. What he's able to do is he's able to really let people kind of confide in him, which is really kind of interesting in how that works, because most of the time, you know, it's all, like, in a romance comedy anime, for instance, it's gonna be somebody, like, bumps over, falls on top of them, and they get to know each other kind of through that. And there are some, like, coincident little things, but the... Like, relationships that Sakata builds, I believe, are a lot more intentional than most rom-com anime that you would kind of uh, come across. The only one that I can think of that kind of has these really good intentional um, character relationships and things in terms of drama is Your Line April. But to be fair, I haven't seen a ton of these romance drama type shows. I've seen a lot more of the comedy end ones. And let me tell you, they're not all that meaningful in how they get to know each other, typically. It's more coincidental. Um, but Sakata, what Sakata does is he gets, he finds a person and that person has puberty syndrome and they're going through this like weird situation, right? And he will sit down with them and, and talk to them and try to get to know them better in order to help them get over their puberty syndrome, right? And this is a, a major way of like, that's how the plot moves. That's how the show goes right? 
Sakata is the, the crux of the show in terms of getting it to move forward. But he's not really focused on. I think this is really kind of made clear that you're not going to get a Sakata arc, so to speak, once we get to Koga. Because Koga is the first one that kind of starts off, I mean, you have the Mai arc, but really that's just kind of character building at that point. But the Koga arc is where it really starts to become clear that Sakata is the, the helper, right? He is the one who hears out the problem, goes to Futaba, figures out what the problem is, and gets it resolved by the end of the arc, whether that's a, like two episodes, three episodes, what have you. When I initially kind of got into to the show, right, I kind of got the idea that Sakata was a loner, and that's not untrue. Um, and you can kind of figure that out in episode four when he reveals he doesn't own a cell phone, right? And he doesn't have a lot of friends either. He's got Hibiki, who's kind of the popular jock, who's kind of busy a lot of the time, and then Futa Futaba, who's more the nerdy, like, behind-the-scenes character, doesn't speak all that much. Um, so when I watched the series and I was looking at it through the eyes of Sakata, I truly thought that by the time I finished the series, this video would be solely about loneliness. And that's not entirely true. It kind of, there's, there's a little bit of that in there, but it's not the entire issue and I'm kind of prancing around it, but I'll get to that. But let me, let me kind of explain a little bit further here. So let me skip ahead to episode eight, because I think this is where a big shift happens in Sakata's character, or well, not even as much a shift as it is we understand him a lot better because of one single conversation, and it's the one that he has with Futaba. Now, it's Futaba, without going through too much here, um, he essentially is trying to build up Futaba's, like, self-worth, right? Because she's having a lot of issues with, like, personality stuff going on, right? Kind of split personality ordeal, I think would be the best way to put it. And he is kind of trying to talk her out, or, like, talk her through it, right? Like, get her to really understand who she is. And he kind of comes out of left field with a statement, in my opinion, when he says, it's okay to hate yourself. I always live thinking, well... I guess this is how things go. And that really got me. That really got me thinking because up to that point, as I said, I had the feeling that Sakata was kind of a, a loner who kind of went laissez-faire through life. But this was the line that brought me to what I think is the main point of the video. But I'm going to continue on a little bit further by saying Sakata's issue is not loneliness. And this is the crux of the video. It's internalizing feelings. But I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Let me explain my point. I want to I need to back this up for you guys. So, this comes to a head in the Kaide arc. It's the final arc of the show. And he doesn't know how to for those of you who know what end up kind of happening um with Kaide. Sakata doesn't really know how to react to what happens with Kaide. Basically, throughout the show, he's the problem solver, right? He goes through and he helps other people solve their problem. But nothing has really affected him all that much. You could argue the Mai arc did, but he wasn't really... He didn't like her then, like he does at the, by the end of the show. So none of these problems that have kind of occurred throughout the course of the show have really personally affected him until the Kaide arc. And when that happens, when the thing with Kaide happens, I'm saying that because I already know there's going to be that one guy who gets here and didn't listen to my spoiler warning and is wondering why I'm talking about spoilers. But for those of you who know what happened with Kaide, it really affected Sakura. To the point where it like ends on a cliffhanger into the last episode. When somebody that Sakata deeply cared about had something happen to them that directly affected how Sakata would live, he didn't know how to deal with it. He, I, I don't want to say he went berserk, but he was an emotional mess to say the least. I think that's about as clear cut as it gets. He was just emotionally just distraught. And it, it was very apparent, and it, 
you really kind of connect to Sakata during those last couple episodes because of it. I think while it's not the main point of the show by any stretch, I think there's a secondary conclusion that you can get from Bunny Girl Senpai that is really kind of beneficial. And that's the fact that it is important to externalize emotions. And, and let me talk about that for a bit. I've got my, got my notepad here. That's how you know I'm serious. Um, so while it's not the main point of the show, I think that it kind of alludes to an interesting point, right? About the internalizing of emotions, uh, specifically the disparity in, in men. And, and don't just take that from, from me. I, I've looked at some studies before this. And from 2010, there was a study that was done, and it was of middle-aged men who had depression. And those, quote, those men, quote, described feelings of loneliness, sadness, and distress, and actively sought emotional support, wanting to share those feelings with loved ones. Now, the article that references this is a bit more modern. It's actually from 2018, and it continues on a little bit further uh, and references another study that I believe is from 2012 that talks about the same kind of topic. It's, it notes that some men from a different study group wanted to talk about their personal difficulties but had no or few people who they trusted with their feelings. So Sakata, throughout the series, he hears everybody else's personal afflictions but has trouble externalizing his own. And among men, bonds in that regard are very important. It is, it is important for, for men to have people to confide in. Um, just as a personal example, just today I had an um, exam grade that didn't come back the way that I wanted it to, and I texted a friend of mine, and I said, hey, I'm doing poorly because of this exam that I had. Not 30 seconds later, I was getting a call from that guy, and, and we talked back and forth for a good long while, and it helped ease the ease the pain of that exam a little bit. Um, it didn't solve the problem um, of the exam, but it did help me feel better, and that was that was very important. So, I guess even though it's not a main point of the series, and, and things do get a little bit more resolved, I would say in the in the follow up movie. Um, but in general, when it comes to the series itself, um, Sakata doesn't have somebody to truly confide in um, throughout the entire series. And so I take all of this just to, um, to make the point of that that's the, that's the lesson that this anime taught me. And I hope that um, maybe this enlightened some of you guys to uh, something maybe you hadn't thought about before. If you have any thoughts about that, feel free to, to leave them in the comments and maybe just elaborate more. I'd love to hear what you guys think of this kind of idea. If you guys agree, if you guys disagree, if you think maybe he had more of a support network than I'm kind of letting on. As I said, I think that he, he gets a little bit more of it as it goes on, but I, I digress a little bit here. All of that to say, I guess, if you, if you know somebody who seems like the loner, who doesn't talk to people, as much who doesn't confide in people, I would say. Maybe talk to them. Maybe maybe ask how they're doing. Simple as that. How you doing? And and don't don't do the passerby. Yeah, how you doing? But but like try to get at what how they're feeling, really. Um, and if you if you out there happen to be a Sakata, I would encourage you to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And that's not to say that I I think you're doing bad. I just, uh, don't don't take it that way, but just just know that if if you need people to confide in, they are out there, and I think that it's important to see that because I I don't think Sakata realized it until it was too late, and his emotions got kind of got the best of him. Um, so that's there you go. That's my that's my thoughts on on Bunny Girl Senpai. I thought the show itself, not looking at the um, at this element of it, but just the show as a whole and the the whole puberty syndrome and everything that happened. I thought it was an excellent show. Um, if you guys want me to do reviews on these shows, by the way, again, comments, easiest way to let me know. But all of that said, I think that's where I'm going to leave it for today. Um, tell your homies you love them. <laughs> Simple as that. That's the message of today's video. I hope you enjoyed. 
and I will see you guys next time.